everybody. Uh, if people want a seat while they're listening, there's an overflow space in the cafe where they're streaming the slides and the presentation over there. So if you can't find a seat, there's space there. Um, thanks for having me here today. Uh, just a few months ago, I got contacted by Lawrence. He was like, you want to give a talk about something? And I was like, I don't know, pick something. He's like, talk about your laptop. I'm like, all right, we'll talk about my laptop. It's, um, it's a work in progress. It's not there yet. Um, there's a demo of it out in the cafe area. You can have a look at where it is right now. But um, I thought I'd share with you some of my experiences kind of going through making it, the motivations, and uh, kind of where we are today. Hopefully you enjoy it. Um, so the genesis of this is I've always wanted to build my own computer from scratch. So uh, on, the, on, the, on the top left there is a picture of the Apple II motherboard circa 1983. This kind of tells you how old I am. I don't know how many of you were even born in 1983. Um, but my, uh, my dad bought a clone of an Apple II uh, back in the day from Taiwan and he put it together himself and it was just sitting there. It had no case. So every time I went to play with it, the, the, the circuits were there calling out to me, and they're shiny, and they're colorful, and I want to touch them. My dad said, no, don't touch them, which is a, exactly means touch them when he's not away, when he's not looking, right? And uh, the great thing is all the chips were in sockets, and it had schematics, and all these kinds of things. So I really had this feeling that, you know, maybe someday I could build one of these myself, right? And so, uh, you know, through, through the years, I've tried many sort of stop-and-go attempts to try and build something on my own in 1998. I built this little embedded thing off of a, with a Hitachi SH-1 risk board. Around 1999, I tried building a Linux computer using the strong arm, but like I, honestly, I didn't really know what I was doing back then, and it, it worked, but it was for another group, and it wasn't really, wasn't, wasn't quite there. Um, then around you know, 2009, after a, a long series of twists and turns through various startups, I ended up at a place called Chumbi, where I decided that you know, I get a chance once again to try and build uh, computers. And this one here is an example. Uh, I built a small embedded computer based on the Fisco MX233. Um, and that was fun. It was cool, but it was still very small. Um, afterwards, we upgraded a bit to a sort of a, sort of a photo frame format uh, device. Uh, this one here has an 800 megahertz CPU on the inside. Again, it's open source. You can play with it. It runs Linux. But again, still not quite there. And then most recently, uh, I built a, another version, um, and I, I have a company here called Kosagi, and, um, and it, this is the Coven uh, board. It has, it has an FPGA, it has an 800 megahertz Linux compu uh, computer on it, and a bunch of things for driving robots and bits and pieces like that. And if I had remembered, I would have brought a few of them to give away here, but no one reminded me to bring them, so you don't have them. Um, <laughs> And then, but the problem was ultimately, I wasn't using these boards that I was building for myself, right? There's this thing, this idea called dog fooding, where if, you know, if it's good, you, you use it yourself. All these sort of little computers I had built in the past was always for someone else and not really for myself. They were like little embedded things. I mean, you know, I'm like the guy who is credited with building the hardware for Chumbi, but sadly, I actually never really used the hardware because it didn't fit my use case. I, I wasn't a big consumer of social media. I don't have a Facebook account. I don't really, really care to be woken up every day to the news report or wherever it is, right? I was just building things for other people. Um, and so I decided that it's time that I build something that I actually want to use. And I was thinking, well, what kinds of things would I actually use? What I, use? I use a laptop every day. I use these pieces of hardware that you know, is a little more full featured. And so um, when I originally came up with the Novena project, uh, the goals were basically build something I would like to use, uh, possibly something like a secure router platform for, or for people who like to build, use things like Tor or for like secure communications. And very importantly, I wanted to push my comfort zone around things I didn't know how to do. Like I hadn't done a PCI Express bus before. I haven't done SATA interfaces. I hadn't done Gigabit Ethernet. I hadn't done DDR3. These are all kind of modern bus interfaces that I had never had a chance to design with because all the previous projects were fairly, I mean, low end in the sense that they didn't involve these um, buses. Um, you know, high power voltage regulators, uh, you know, the full custom battery management solution, all these things go into a laptop and these are elements that I didn't know prior to starting the project but I had to learn. Um, and so I started design in June 2012 and there's a sort of a nomenclature that you'll hear sometimes from on the industry called the EVT, DVT, PVT. Um, EVT stands for Engineering, Validation, and Testing. The D stands for Design, and P stands for Production. And the idea is it's kind of a three-stage cycle. Like Guys like Apple and other big companies use this kind of nomenclature. Say EVT is where basically you, you know, there's no chances anything works, but you just do build your first prototype. 
The D stands sorry, like now you're in design validation, so you're basically feature complete and making sure that everything is, 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 is correct, and then PVT is the thing you're at right before production. So I kicked off the EVT cycle in June 2012. Um, the first thing to do was to figure out what CPU I would use for uh, my project. And so I, I considered a number of uh, vendors, Marvell, Freescale, Samsung, NVIDIA. Um, this sort of graphic on the right-hand side was like a, just a, 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 a screenshot of sort of the things I had considered while trying to put this together. You know, things like the max CPU speed, the peripheral sets, what kinds of graphics could, you know, Accelerator was built into it. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, and as, if you'll notice, actually, if you can, if you can kind of read that, some of the items in there are redacted because I can't actually share them with you because they're NDA. And this is a really big problem. Actually, most CPU vendors, like for example, Qualcomm's on this list with the Snapdragon because you can't even get like basics on the on the on the thing without signing an NDA with them. Fortunately, at the time, I still had an NDA with Marvell, so I knew what was on the inside. But a lot of these. Uh, devices, you basically have to guess or really negotiate with the with the CPU vendor to, to even know what they're capable of, right? Um, there's one notable exception to that, and that's Freescale. Freescale, you can go online right now to the website and look at the IMX6 CPU, and you can download the whole user manual, 5,000 pages of Lovin, that you can go ahead and start reading and designing with. You can go to DigiKey and buy the Freescale CPU that I'm using right now. It's in stock. You don't have to go and sign a vendor agreement or anything like this. So. And Freescale just you know pushes all their code into the into the Linux trees. They're, you know it's mainlined. I mean overall the big thing that really guided me towards using the Freescale CPU is the fact that they they really believe in openness. They believe in sharing their stuff, and it's really easy to work with them. So despite you know and, and they're also a pretty decent CPU. So just you know despite all the you know other columns having green in them, Freescale actually ended up being one of the best matches for what we wanted to do. So we decided to use the Freescale IMX6, which offers a quad-core variant, and also if you want to go to a lower cost version, they um, have what's called like the dual and dual light versions. They actually fit in the same spot on the circuit board, so you can make a lower cost version without having to read out anything, which I really like as well. Um, and for the people back there, if there's, there's room in the cafe, you can sit over there and get, get the, um, if, you, if you want to be more comfortable, you can, there's a room in there, they're kind of live streaming the, the, uh, the talk over there. Um, so then the next step was to do a block diagram to try and figure out you know, how and what we were going to do. Um, this is sort of like pretty much kind of like the near final diagram they went at. I mean, it, it kind of just shows I mean, at the middle is IMX6, right? And then we, you know, how many ports we want to break out and you know, what, what SATA we're going to use and you know, how the power system was going to work out. And actually a lot of thought and effort goes in at this, at this, at this phase because it's extremely hard to change a feature set down the road. As you see, there's a lot of effort that goes into building these. So we want to make sure that we got everything right. Spent a lot of time thinking about the block diagram. Um, another thing that it's interesting to emphasize about these systems is that, uh, can, can people hear me without this mic? Okay, I don't, I don't like this thing. Um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, these, these SOCs, system on chips, have a huge uh, variety of I.O. options. So for here is an example, like this is a, this is a tool they would give to us. Um, and this would be sort of like the pad name. So you can go ahead and say, okay, here's the external memory interface data. And it has like six different alternate modes. It could be SPI, it can be uh, I2C, it can be UART, it can be GPL, all these different things. And actually going through this feature matrix is very complicated because you, when you say I want to have like three SPI ports, they might be on ports that, that conflict with other features that you want to use. So we spent a lot of time then going from the block diagram through these planning tools to try to figure out where the pins would be associated for the CPU to make sure that we had no conflicts across the feature set. And it also makes, even at the driver level, it's very confusing because like you have to basically in Linux tell which pin goes to what and that's always an endless source of pain. Um, after we had uh, gone through that exercise, we went to schematic entry. Um, schematic entry is, is as it sounds. We're designing the schematics and laying out all the blocks and so forth. It turns out that actually, uh, at, for these system level designs, you spend most of your time designing power systems, right? Because once you've actually gone through the IO mux and the IO planning, really the schematic entry is like I take the I squared C wire and I hook up to this wire, and I take SAT and I hook up. To, like a lot of these interfaces are very simple. Um, the, but the real challenge is deciding how the power system is going to work. And when you're designing something particularly like a laptop, the power system planning is extremely difficult. You have to think about the shutdown modes, the standby modes, the battery modes, and then making sure there's enough capacity. Like, you know, what happens if someone decides to plug in 
two tablets at once, each drawing 1.5 amp and charging both at the same time. Do you have a system enough to you know, provide the juice to do that without shutting down? It's actually, that's a, a, you know, 1.5 amps times five is a lot of power, seven and a half watts. It's, so you're, you're doing 15 watts out two USB ports. That's more than the, the total system draw of the system just charging two iPads. But people, if you hand them a laptop and they plug in two tablets to charge, they expect that to work. Um, and so we have to go ahead and consider all those funny cases. Uh, then after we uh, went through the schematic design, we went to the board layout. So there's a screenshot of the board layout tool. This is the, um, the CPU core area over here. Um, the board ended up being a 10 layer board. Um, I probably could have done an eight, but I was a little lazy and I went with 10. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of time and effort spent pulling traces and pulling wires. Uh, one of the most time consuming things is doing the um, DDR3 memory interface. Uh, you're running fast enough that the speed of light matters. Uh, my you know, general rule of thumb is that uh, in one nanosecond, which if, if you're running at one gigahertz, that's one clock cycle, light travels that far in free space. On a circuit board, light travels that far, right? And this is on the order of the size of things you're worrying about on the circuit board. So if I have differences in the length, trace, lengths, trace lengths by a couple of millimeters, it can destroy the timing of, this, of the device. It, it wouldn't work. So we spent a lot of time actually putting all these, I don't know if you can see these, but there's these little, like, Wiggly wiggly is all up here, like the traces go like wiggle 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 and stuff. Uh, it's not just because I'm, I just like making wiggles, it's because I'm trying to make them all exactly the same length as each other. Can you hear me all right? Um, I can't see the... Uh, you can't see yeah, the slides? It's actually showing your main screen. Up there. Oh jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Let me try it anyway. Share your screens. Is that working? I have to go over there and see. Okay. But oh. Just go ahead. Audio is perfect. Audio is perfect, but you yeah. might have to see the screen. Okay. okay. Well, I'm trying to share it. Okay. Let's see it. Okay. Me. Sorry. Maybe the maybe the maybe the live casting isn't working. Um. So yeah, that's the board routing uh, that we that we had to go through. Um, after we went through and did all the board routing, we did some extensive three D modeling. So we have a full. 3D model of the circuit board. When you're trying to build something that needs to be like flat and small, every millimeter matters. Like you get really anorexic thinking about these things. And so uh, in order to make sure that the case fits together, you're not wasting tons of space, we build uh, very complex 3D models that basically accurate model all the pieces so that when we actually get to the case design stage, we are not um, hit with any nasty or unexpected surprises. So this is, the, uh, this is what initially came out after that exercise. Um, this is a, uh, a scan of the circuit board. Uh, the, the current, I'll, I'll kind of go through the revisions, but at the EBT revision, we actually had a plan to make it Raspberry Pi compatible with expansion ports, and we had some digital I.O. connectors and all these bits and pieces. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is what the board looked like after the first implementation. Uh, this is actually from an email I sent. Um, I don't know, is Sean here? Is Sean, Sean around? No, Sean, Sean, that I'm working with. No, he's not around. But anyways, it takes two hands to build something like this, a hardware hand and a software hand. So he's the software hand. He should get at least as much credit as I do uh, for doing this. And this was, this was my email to him on December 8th. No smoke, no fire, but I get this. Um, and so this is actually U-Boot running for the first time on the device. I was like ecstatic. Basically, we powered it on, and it started doing something interesting. So um, the cool thing was we never had to get to the level of doing JTAG or anything like that to bring it up. Basically, we had a firmware image that we had brought up initially on another reference board, was able to bring over into micro SD, and then go ahead and boot it and, and sort of get running from there. Not that everything was easy from that point. There was a lot of work still from there. But at least we were able to talk to the CPU, which is a, a, a big first test. Um, then after we got past the first boot, we went through a validation matrix. Actually, if you go to our wiki, um, there's actually the entire matrix and the status of all the subsystems is publicly shared. There's, this is just the, the top like third of it. There's actually 60 lines. Every feature that we had in that block diagram has an entry in the matrix. So we have to validate every I squared C bus, every single USB port, every single feature, the USB power switches. The speakers, the utility double E proms, all of the modes of the SD cards, all the audio, input, output, microphone, every single thing that we had put in the original block diagram, we have to make sure all those things work before we move on to the next stage. This actually takes a really long time. This took several months for us to get through this, and we're still actually working through some detailed validation of some of the more complex, hairy features. So, uh, you know, a lot of times people think that 
a lot of the magic in these things is in the design stage. Actually, most of the effort is in validation and bring up. Um, we have a build system that we put together ourselves. So a company called Atira was, was kind enough to go ahead and build a private virtual cloud in my flat. Um, it's not as exciting as it sounds. It's two, it's two computers next to my laundry basket. Um, but the, the great thing is that, I mean, God bless Singapore, I have 100 megabit connections to my flat, two of them. And, and so we can go ahead and we can put cloud images in there and share them with other people and have them use it. You, you couldn't do this in the United States. It wouldn't be possible. So, um, and so we, we have this private cloud-based flow for doing open embedded. Um, you know, we can go and allocate machines, hand them to friends, and have people do development on it. Uh, and then basically once we got past that bring up point, we transitioned to sort of a Debian Ubuntu build with custom kernels. Um, and then we're now transitioning to native builds on Novena. So we're actually using the laptop itself to build its own images. And we're actually in the process of pushing all of the code patches we're doing up into the mainline. So we're actually checking the code that we're doing into Linus Torvald's tree. So it's actually part of the mainline Linux. You can go ahead, anyone can then later on go ahead, pull down Linus's tree, build it, and run it on our device. So we're really trying to make this a full mainstream device as opposed to sort of an instance based hack. And that actually, it's a lot of work to push patches up into Linus's tree. There's a very high coding standard they have for that. So we don't, we don't get to go ahead and say, well, we'll just go ahead and do like a poke or a peek to get past this problem and that problem. We actually have to go and write proper device tree entries and go ahead and make sure we play correctly with all the standards. And then someone else will do a patch that stomps our stuff and then we have to fix our things to deal with their patches. So it's a lot of work to do that. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, I think it will be worth it because I think we'll have an actual proper system that's community supported as, as opposed to what we've typically done in the past, which is a bunch of instance specific hacks that are difficult to absorb by other people. Um, so I made a blog post in December 2012 just as I was like, hey, I'm doing this project, maybe people want to know about it. I didn't even think it would be that big. I was really overwhelmed by this re response. There's like 300 plus comments, and it, I had a million views in one week. Um, a lot of people were like, you should kickstart it, yay. And I was like, oh no, kickstart. And then, you know, so some really supportive feedback. I mean, my favorite one was like, someone's, it's like watching a Jedi construct his own lightsaber. I'm like, wow, that's really quite nice for someone to say that. <laughs> Uh, on, the, on the downside, it was pretty clear to me that most readers didn't understand what the hell I was trying to do. Um, a lot of them were like, well, if you sold it for less than 500 bucks, maybe I'd buy it. I'm like, well, sure, of course you'd buy it. It would be cheaper than almost anything on the market, right? And a lot of people were like, well, if you would only play games really fast, I'd buy it. Or, I'm like, really? Like, I'm building something for me, right? Um, and a lot of people also really don't understand that the choice to go with an ARM architecture meant that there's a lot of common desktop apps that just aren't going to run on this thing, right? And people are like, where's my Skype? Where's my, I don't know, whatever they want on my Microsoft tool. I mean, uh, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't run on it. I'm like, sorry, guys. Like, you know, there's a lot of stuff it's not going to do, but I'm completely okay with, but they probably wouldn't be. They would be upset and return it to me. So um, maybe, maybe someone could fix, help me fix that here. Um, so I decided, like, how do I make it clear that this is not your uncle's laptop, right? Um, I wanted to, so when we went from the EBT to the DBT stage, I did some feature tweaks, right? I really want, I, you know, I, I, after sort of reading through the comments and thinking about what I want to do with it, I focused on the FPGA. Um, I decided I would focus on high-end hackers, so I decided I would forget the Arduino and Raspberry Pi interfaces and build my own high-speed expansion system that favored sort of capability of the product over necessarily ease of use. Uh, I wanted to put a high-end display in there because I'm sort of a snob when it comes to pixels, and so we want to put a retina display in it. Um, and I feel like retina displays are kind of an endpoint in the LCD arms race. There's really not a lot of point going much higher resolution than that, so I feel like if I went and bit the bullet and developed a retina display adapter, uh, I wouldn't regret it later on. And so in March 2013, we, we taped V2 out. I'll just talk a little bit about, 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 little bit more about these upgraded features. Did, how many people here know what an FPGA is? Heard of it? Know about it? Okay. So not everybody. I'll, I'll go very quickly behind what these things are. An FPGA is a field programmable gate array. Imagine a piece of hardware that you can basically code on the fly. The FPGA itself is dynamically upgradable. It looks like a piece of memory you can MMAP to. Um, and then you can go ahead and have it do custom operations for you in hardware. So if you want to offload some crypto processing, or if you want to offload some DSP, or if you just want to do some front-end signal acquisition, you can actually, in code, write Verilog, compile it to the FPGA, push it to there, and that piece of hardware is now part of your system. 
So this is like sort of the ultimate thing for people to go, who want to play with hardware, but don't actually want to touch a soldering iron. You can actually design hardware, put it in there, and use it yourself. So I really wanted to sort of focus on this feature. This is a very unique feature that no other laptop has. I mean, no laptop in the right mind would have it in there anyways. Um, and and I, it's something that I would use all the time. I love FPGAs. Pretty much every design I've done for the past couple of years have it in there. Even if I don't know what I'm going to do with it today, I never regret putting it in there later on because it's always good to have some generic hardware around. Um, in addition to the FPGA, the FPGA has its own private 2 gigabit DDR3 buffer. So that way you can go ahead and do very high speed signal acquisition um, with the FPGA. And then there's the high speed header, which is this little white thing on the left hand side. Um, it, can, it has 16 differential pairs running to it, which doesn't sound too exciting. People don't know what differential pairs are, but it means I can go ahead and push a lot of data into it. In other words, I can basically turn this thing into oscilloscope or a logic analyzer, or I can run HDMI into it, or I can do a bunch of different things and do signal and protocol level analysis with this laptop without having to have another tool next to it. This is very exciting to me. Um, we did the retina adapter. And so uh, in, 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 this, in, in particular, the architecture we, f this, we finalized on for the laptop's LCD interface was that we decided not to lock ourselves into any given LCD. One of the problems is that like, if I say I'm gonna use this, like this has a 1600 by 900 display. If I'm gonna use that, a lot of times they all have proprietary connectors. They're all very unique to that display. And so you can really get locked in. And we, we had some use cases. For example, Sean likes to go ahead and take these adventure trips. He wants to go take the Trans-Siberian Railroad. He, ra Railroad. he will need a laptop that can run for one week without having to be recharged. The only way to do that is to put a pixel chi display on the inside of it, right? But we don't want to necessarily design in the pixel chi display because that doesn't fit everyone's use case all the time. So we're using this concept of these mezzanine adapter boards. So we have this little adapter board that goes between our sort of common LCD interface bus to something else. And so the first mezzanine board that we built was this retina adapter. We have to go from basically dual LVDS to embedded display port, which then goes to the retina display. You can, you can see a demo of that running uh, today. Uh, another thing that, uh, as I mentioned before, there's this, this hack port that I put in there that has lots of differential pairs going through it and so forth. We've actually already used the hack port in some other projects. So this is a picture here of um, the hack port with a flexible PCB that we designed plugged into it. And beneath it, for a size comparison, is a piece of flash memory. And so we were actually able to already use the FPGA and the internal DDR memory to emulate a piece of NAND flash. This is extremely useful if you're trying to reverse engineer, for example, uh, an embedded device that boots from flash. We can go ahead and take a binary image of it, go ahead and emulate it with the device, and the memory is dual ported so we can see live what's being accessed by the flash, what's being modified. We can go ahead and say, you can do a signature validation check on, on the flash memory, and then go ahead and patch over it once the check is done, and if they won't even know it, you can go ahead and load your own code. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with this, with, with this level of tool. Um, another thing we've done is we've actually gone ahead and uh, uh, built a SD card emulator with this, so we're able actually to plug in SD cards um, and analyze the microcontroller on the inside, as well as control the flash on the inside of it, to the point where you can go ahead and now modify and do interesting abusive things with, with SD cards. There'll be a presentation about this later this year in a different context. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the DVT board arrived in Singapore in May 2013. Uh, as you, and if you look at the two previous boards, the biggest change, the most obvious change is right here. This used to be a Raspberry Pi header and a bunch of low speed headers, and now it's like an FPGA with memory and a bunch of other things that I really want to put there. Uh, the rest of the board, Superficially, it looks similar, but there's a lot of small tweaks that are used to improve the performance and stability of the system. Um, after we did that, um, we decided that we would do some industrial design, mechanical design. So as I mentioned before, there, is a, there was a thought about using this as like a secure router platform. So this is a, um, an example. When I mean, we did all the CAD work and so forth for this, this is, this is us using the 3D model of the board and then the case around it and all the bits and pieces and, and then you know, the little common elements that we all know for size reference over there. Um, and then uh, that's, we, we built like a couple of these just as a prototype case. So that's actually um, what was up there now shown in here in this form. And as you can evidence from the logo on it, there might be a hint as to what this might be useful for. Um, <laughs> we haven't really talked about that yet, though. Um, but whatever, we're all friends. Uh, future developments is, you know, now that we're kind of, this is sort of where we are today. Um, we want to now finalize 
the kind of laptop-like industrial design, now that we've done the simple case design, um, I'm really focusing on the ease of access of internals. Like, like laptops right now, if you want to take them apart, is an epic endeavor, and usually they don't go back together quite the same. Um, so part of the reason that's the case is they're very small and very thin. We're going to burn a couple extra millimeters to, to allow for um, sort of screw affordances and things you can use to easily access the internals. We can take the keyboard out and move it away very quickly. So you can do a lot of um, user swappable components. There'll be some digitally fabricated components, the so 3D printed parts and laser cut parts, so that if you want to switch out things on the inside, you can also sort of print the case component that goes with it, um, so you're not locked into these um, designs. Uh, the upshot of it means it's not going to be that pretty. It's not going to be like a sexy laptop, but it'll be pretty practical. But that's generally my style. Um, and the other thing I'm working on is the um, analog front end development. So I want to um, add, finally, the high-speed data acquisition system. I'm very excited about using this as an oscilloscope. Uh, and I'm trying to develop some novel probe and analog signal management systems. Uh, it turns out that a very expensive part of a lot of oscilloscopes is actually the probes themselves. The probes are cost like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So I want to try and do something that you might not recognize it as a conventional oscilloscope probe, but actually have very good performance and it'll be much cheaper. Um, so ultimately, uh, the positioning of this is actually much closer to think about this as like a Python script oscilloscope as opposed to like a Linux laptop, right? Because what I really want to use is like an oscilloscope that I can script. Um, and, and also, likewise, the one of the nice things about this is if you look here on the diagram, on the left, the oscilloscopes of, these, of this kind of caliber go for two to five thousand dollars, whereas laptops of this caliber go for one to two thousand dollars. I like the idea of going for a higher price point, really. That's, that's good for me, and it's good for you know, smaller, low run products like this. Going for like down the, the cost hole is not going to be a happy place for me to end up. Um, and the most important thing at the end of the day is it's going to be enabling for things that I like to do. So this is an example of uh, a, a typical scenario. There's this thing called differential power analysis, where uh, currently today it requires an oscilloscope, a computer, some custom boards. It's a big sort of setup that you have to carry around. So if you go to a customer site or if you're trying to do some surreptitious hacking, you have to lug all this equipment and it's not very subtle. Um, the, but basically the idea is that you have a computer that talks to your device that you're trying to test and you have an oscilloscope that measures sort of the power signature analysis of the device. So uh, this is an example here, I just scraped it off the web, of someone showing a, a DES, um, hardware DES unit. And basically when the key loads, you can go ahead and see in the power signature the key load sequence happening. And then when the key schedules, you can see a different signature in the power. And then, when the, and then based upon the different rounds, you actually find out that based upon a one or a zero in the key, the power signature is different. And so by just looking at the power fluctuation analysis of these things, you can go ahead and recover keys from cryptographic devices. Again, it normally takes this, this big setup, but now I'm building a device where I can just carry a single laptop to a customer site, plug it in, and go ahead and do this sort of analysis in an automated fashion. So this is what I call dog fooding, right? This is something that I would use, I would really like to have, and so I'm trying to design this for myself. And that's it, some Q&A, so I have a couple minutes left. Yeah. I guess we'll do The most obvious question, what is your timeline for getting uh, to finishing this? Uh, okay, the, the timeline for finishing this, um, when I feel like it. <laughs> I, 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 it's a sort of a flip answer, but one of the things I have like, very conscientiously done, I have not kickstarted it, I haven't taken money from anyone to do it per se, right? Um, and so the idea is like, I can do this on the schedule that suits me. That all this is being done in my spare time, right? So it's not like my like people see this post about the laptop and say, so is that like the thing you're doing? Is that like what you do now? I'm like, it's my hobby, right? I have other things I do to pay the bills, but this one doesn't pay the bills, right? And so um, so it'll get done when it gets done. Okay, uh, so the, basically the question is, is how long is the battery life for this thing? So one of the things that we, decisions I made when designing the power system is I wanted you to be able to buy the battery that you want to use to give you the life that you need versus the weight of the thing. A lot of these devices, they sort of come with 
built-in batteries. If you want more battery life, you're screwed. If you want less, you want lighter, you, you're not. So what we're using is we're using um, standard radio control car cells, so RC cells, that you can go ahead and buy from like Hobby King or wherever it is and plug them in. And you can go ahead and dial in the battery life that you want. So you can go ahead and put like a 200 watt hour battery in there and have it run like days. Or you can go ahead and put like a 20 watt hour battery in there and have it run like, you know, hours or something like that. Um, that's a very deliberate decision because it's very hard to, particularly with all the peripheral sets and stuff, like uh, most of the power is actually burned in the LCD itself. That's what really causes a lot of the burn. But for example, like I said, Sean wants to go take the Trans Siberian Railroad with a Pixel Chi display. He wants to last a week. He might get a really big battery and use a Pixel Chi and run forever. Some people may have other designs for it. So it's, it's deliberately modular and um, uh, user configurable. Um, question over there. Uh, what's your bandwidth on the analog input? On the analog input, so the, his question is, what's the bandwidth on the analog input? So the the precise answer to this is that the analog input has yet to be designed. That's in the works. Um, the available digital bandwidth for these is 16 differential pairs, each pair capable of close to a gigabit per second, right? So there's a lot of digital bandwidth available. The analog bandwidth will depend upon the AD converters I use and so forth. I'm initially targeting 500 megahertz sampling rate, 500 mega samples per second, which means the actual analog bandwidth should be lower due to Nyquist constraints. Um, so it's not going to be like a super high end scope doing giga, you know, gig, giga samples per second, but it's good enough for doing the kinds of things I want to do. Yeah, this is a question about power. Yeah, so. Uh, are you inclined to go away from lithium ion? Uh, would you choose lithium I mean, polymer? Yeah. Or I would prefer a solar power. Okay. So there's a, there's a question about the power. Like, am I using lithium ion, lithium polymer? Or can we do support things like solar power? So the, uh, the laptop design itself, um, I don't know if I can bring it back to that page with a picture of the. Ah, here we go. This actual board itself doesn't have the, the battery front end on it. And that's also another design decision. Uh, this looks like a SATA connector. It's actually a battery connector. Um, because because SATA, SATA, anyways, long story for why I use it, there's a lot of things that are actually perfect for doing that, that, that hack. Um, and if you look at the sample that's sitting out there in the cafe, there's actually a little board that I use to adapt to the chemistry that you want to use. So the current chemistry I'm targeting is lithium polymer. Um, because it is, ion is really bad. well, you can also use lithium ion as well. They're very similar to in chemistry wise. You could probably plug it in; it would work. But the reason I'm doing it is because you can buy the RC control batteries, right? They're they're easy, they're cheap. Everyone can buy them, and you can pick what you want to do with it, right? And one actually one of the really cool things about the RC batteries is that you can charge them super fast, right? So like like you can do the the hack where you go ahead, even though you, it takes you 12 hours to discharge it, you can charge it in like 40 minutes. So I love that. I love being able to charge my laptop in like you know thirty or forty minutes and not have to wait for it. Um, but that's all. Those are all features that you design into the battery board. If you want to make it solar powered, that's certainly a possibility. You would add that to that battery controller board. Um, I think the power envelope of the back of the laptop is big enough that it's still probably not practical for solar power unless you really went with a Pixel Chi display and downclock the CPU and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's a few watts. And to get a few watts of solar, you need like a panel about this big, which is, which is pretty big. So, uh, questions still? I know you're doing it as an open hardware project, but like, um, do you have, like, how can the community contribute to the project? Or are you just doing it by yourself for now? Uh, the question was, it's an open hardware project, and how can the community contribute to it? Um, so, I mean, you can go to my website now. You can download all the schematics and source files for the board itself. And some people have actually already gone, gone and done that. Like, I, I, I just got this funny email the other day from Richard Stallman, and, 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 and I guess he's using this company in China, and he asked the company in China to go ahead and copy this and make one for him. I'm like, okay, fine. You can go ahead and do that all you want. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, you, you know... Um, I think the the thing is right now I'm I'm because it's a hobby project and I don't I don't really have a lot of time. Um, I'm very cautious about handing out the units that I have to other developers because because some people will get it and they won't do anything with it, and some people get it and they ask a lot of questions and it'd be a big drag. And so we do we do have a few people who are helping us with this now. Um, you know, there's some select developers. Um, you know, I think I think 
at the moment. Like if you're really excited and you have something, you, you know, a very focused thing that you want to do with it, you know, we can talk about enabling those kinds of things. But at the moment, I'm, I'm just not ready. Like we, like our, our build tree is really not in a state to hand over to someone else. The code's really not documentable enough. Like we're, everything's sort of evolving. So if you got involved, it would be a lot of your time. It would be a pain in the butt for you. So. Um, we can have a couple of questions more. Any other? Uh, like, uh, uh, you said that uh, I think your friend is doing the software part. Yeah. So, like, uh, as we see, the technology is so fast, and we, like, you talk about the Linux kernel, coding on it, now we have the device trees on it. Mm -hmm. So, how difficult is it to, like, to cope up, like, you are doing some stuff and some new technology? Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to, like, cope up with the new technology? Uh, so his his question is like as we're doing sort of the Linux kernel development, uh, the Linux Linux itself is a moving target, and the question is how hard is it dealing with that? It's very hard. Um, we spend a lot of time um, trying to push patches into the main line, and so for example, we were just committing the PCI Express patches into the main line, and by the time we got the patches there, someone else had beat us to committing a patch of a different thing. And so then we had to pull down their code, modify ours to work with theirs, and then resubmit the patch. So, you know, it's not like we write a driver once. I think we write a driver on average three or four times before it's actually really pulled into the Linux mainline. The good news is the theory is once it's actually in there, then someone else has to do that task of pulling down our driver and then <laughs> at, that, at that point in time. And so it, it kind of stays in the main line. That's a theory at least. Um, I think it's worth it. I mean, I think it's important to, to do that correctly for the community and get the technology into there. Um, you know, and the other thing is, is that this is not, if this goes well, this is not going to be the only laptop motherboard I make, right? Like once they have like a 64-bit version of the ARM available at, to mere mortals like me, I would like to do something like that. And so there will be an ongoing sort of like evolution of the device over time. And, and the case is being designed accordingly to allow for you to reuse the case and display and the battery and just swap out the motherboard and then you can reuse the code and so forth. That's all actually very important uh, for me to have sort of this future proofing built into it. I find it ridiculous that we throw away like whole laptops just to swap out the CPU these days. Um, any other questions? How can we learn about this building hardware like a laptop from scratch? How can you learn about building a laptop from scratch? Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I, I'm trying to document what I do on my wiki, so a lot of the, uh, well, it's not like a how-to guide, I try to document the scale of things, and, and you'll, like, you, like you'll notice, there's actually very little talked about the actual design, and a lot talked about the validation, because that's really where the hard part is in all these things, is making sure they work right. Anyone can put wires down on the board, few people can get them to work right. Um, in terms of just getting into the hardware bits and pieces, there's a lot of really good starting points out there. I mean, there's the Raspberry Pi, there's Arduino, there's a lot of people who have and there's Eagle and all these tools out there. But the one thing I would say is if you really want to eventually get to the point of doing something like a laptop, you don't want to use Eagle. Right? A lot of people bitch at me in the hardware world and says, why didn't you do your laptop in Eagle? I have to, you know, and I'm like, you can't do this in Eagle. It's like impossible. Eagle is not capable of doing these kinds of things. I, I pay for a license of Altium, which is very expensive, but it's well worth it for me in the end of the day because, it, because once you have the right tool, it's actually not that hard, to be honest. A lot of people say hardware is hard, well, it's because you're using Eagle, right? Hardware is a lot easier when you have the right tool. It's sort of like, you know, I'm going to go ahead and use Ed to write all my code as opposed to Emacs, right? It's like, well, of course you're using Ed. It's going to be very hard to use a line editor to write code. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, there isn't like really sophisticated free design tools out there. Um, I would, if I had my way, I would like to convince the Singapore government to buy a site license for the island so that people can use <laughs> Altium. <laughs> I actually suggested that to the other day. Like, what could we do for the, I was like, well, if you bought a site license of Altium so anyone here could go ahead and do these things, maybe we could like hold a little course so we can go ahead and modify like boards like Novita and then we could go ahead and fab them and you could you see how easy it is to do. But until we get to the point where like we have these tools available for the public, it is a little bit tough. So. Uh, on the topic of validation, the way I understood it, you're testing each of these components are working, right? Um, do you have like, I don't know, a USB key that you plug in and then a green light comes on and then that's, that's good. Then you move, I don't know, to the Mini Express. Right. Do, you have, do you have all these sort of there, there's, so there's, devices? You're, so you're asking a really, really good question. And there's two levels of testing um, in engineering. There's, there's validation and then there's sort of like production testing. 
When I say validation, this, this isn't something that is a green on and off thing. Oftentimes, for example, if I'm validating the Ethernet at Mac, I actually have to put an oscilloscope on it and look at the waveform and verify that the margins are correct on the waveform. This is not, even, even if I could configure the device into the test mode, there still has to be an engineer who looks at the waveforms to confirm that there's enough uh, margin in all the different things. That's, that's like the deep validation testing that we're doing in the, in the matrix. Once you've done that, then it's a matter of did every board get made identically so that waveform is the same on every single one. That turns into a green-red test. And so once, once we actually finish the whole design and say we're going to do a mass production run of these, we will then actually spend a lot of time actually turning all these tests into red-green tests so that someone on a factory line who doesn't speak English, who doesn't know anything about these things, can just plug it in and say, this works or this doesn't work. Um, and, that, and actually, if, if you see some of my other talks about like building hardware products, one of the points I like to make to people is that when you build any hardware product, you're actually building two. One is the product itself, and the other one is the tester for the product. A lot of people forget that they actually have to test these things. They just hand it to the factory and say, it's going to work. It doesn't work like that. It takes a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. So. Awesome. So thanks, uh, Bunny. Thank you so much. Uh